There's lots of empty seats up here for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everyone um, uh, to our building committee meeting. Thank you for coming. I know there's a lot more people from the park team tonight, so that's uh, very important. It's regionals, right, Jeff? Is it regionals tonight? No, it's a state final. It's a state final tonight. It okay. is? No. That's what I thought, and then somebody said it wasn't. Isn't it? No. I think, it is. I think it's regional. Southern District. Southern right? Yeah. yeah. I it's guess it's the regional I think the state one is on. If Who are they playing tonight? tonight? They're playing the in Greeley. Greeley. Okay. Greeley. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think. So. Big deal. Anyway. <clears throat> a lot of That's awesome. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's, it's great. great. Yeah. 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 So um, let's start with introductions. Aaron, do you want to start? Sure. Aaron Taylor, schoolmaster of the elementary school. Andy Patton, a resident. John Grimmick, resident and engineer. Del Peavy, special services director. Ross Street, school board. Valerie Vandal, town council. Phil Saucer on the school board. Tim Thompson, citizen. R.C. Weeks, business manager for the school department. Evening, Matt Sturgis, town manager. Wolf, Heather Oldenburg, school board. Kimberly Carr, the school board. Perry Schwartz, facilities and transportation director. Hope Sarad, school board. Caitlin Ramsey, middle school band director. Tracy, <coughs> principal of middle school. Peter Esposito, school nutrition director. Jason Angelides, Pond Cove principal. Chuck Shedd, high school principal. Uh, moving out into our audience. Derek Converse, uh, parent. Tom Dunham, citizen. <coughs> Um, I am going to read the building committee charge. Um, we are charged with reviewing the needs assessment report, determining priorities, determining the size and scope of the future building project and bond, and then making a re recommendation to the school board. Okay, and I am reviewing our strategic goals uh, for 2020-2025, uh, there are five of them. Health and well-being, our schools will provide a supportive <coughs> learning environment in which physical, social, and emotional well-being are valued and promoted. Global competency, our students will be personally responsible, aware, and empathetic, and engage local and global citizens. Multiple pathways and definitions of success, our schools will value, promote, and celebrate multiple pathways and definitions of success. Safe, sustainable, and effective facilities. Our schools will be safe and effective facilities. They will be updated and maintained to meet the needs of students and staff in accordance with long-term financial planning. And environmental responsibility. The school department will prioritize environmental responsibility, including stewardship and sustainability. So you have a sheet that summarizes the, um, the brainstorming we did at the last meeting uh, about what um, the different areas mean, uh, safe, effective, um, and so on. So just to point out that that should be, um, you, have, you have some minutes, there's a couple different tactics, but that is, um, that's a sheet um, that you have. Uh, you have some in the minutes from the last meeting and some other things that we we'll talk about as we go through. Okay. Uh, so next up is Carrie's presentation of the maintenance presentation of challenges and spending. Okay. Not much of a presentation, but um, I wanted to thank Marcy. Oh, for sorry. 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 My chart together here. And everybody has a copy of that in the packet. Everybody should have this in their packet. The chart just basically represents the overall maintenance cost throughout all our buildings, the high school, municipal, and pond cove over the years. And uh, you can see the, the increase really starts to shoot up, uh, shoot up around 2016. Uh, you know, we're really starting to see some uh, repercussions of the wear and tear on the building. What's not in your packet is just something I prepared to talk a little bit about tonight. And, <clears throat> And this is basically just on my assumption that it seems like we're all kind of pointed in a direction of maybe the middle school or pond cove could be like a phase one of this of this uh, project or projects. So I 
the numbers that I'm going to read off to you guys right now is solely based on Pond Cove and the middle school and, and focusing on that building. But unexpected large expenses that I had this year, um, and this is just since uh, July 1st, we've done $9,900 in re roofing repairs in both the Pond Cove and middle school <clears throat> that were unforeseen repairs needing to be done. $5,500 to replace a faulty sprinkler system riser, which is basically the supply, the six inch main water feed for the building. Um, we had a false trigger in the Pond Cove, well, basically, basically both schools, uh, a while back where it was basically due to this faulty system that caused a, uh, a fire alarm where students had to go out in the middle of the cold weather and stand outside while it was figured out what was causing the the problem. Uh, we had $5,200 to replace a micro switch on the middle school stage elevator. It's just a small lift to allow uh, accessibility for somebody in a wheelchair to go from floor level to the stage. I've had people ask, well, what does a new lift cost? I got a quote of around $46,000 to replace that lift. It's about a little larger than the size of a phone booth. Um, to replace uh, $3,280 $3, to replace a faulty compressor that went in the walk-in cooler where we had some food spoil, and $1,400 to repair a frozen hot water coil in the middle school kitchen, which just happened not too long ago, and uh, there were some other damages for that. <coughs> and also those are kind of just band-aids for if you want to talk about that a little bit. Correct. Anyway, it's not. Yeah, that, that repair is just a band-aid, and I'm actually going to come down oh, to that okay. shortly. But those totaling $25,280 were unforeseen, and it, these are just the larger ones, unforeseen expenses that were not prepared for in a uh, facility's maintenance budget for the year. Some of the repercussions or things that are also coming up <coughs> it, that need to be addressed is $5,000 to replace a six inch triple action shutoff valve for the heating system. I can't give you really all the details on that, but it's just a, a, a valve that is completely worn, down, worn out. Uh, $8,500 to replace that hot water coil that had burst um, uh, where we did the $1,400 repair. To replace that coil and have it be a more permanent solution to the problem is $8,500. We are currently working with the insurance company to see if we can get that covered as an insurance claim. Uh, $1,900 to replace a deteriorating sprinkler line in the middle school. That was another problem that was found when we had lost power in the school. Uh, the guys showed up after the <coughs> fire alarm had triggered and then we found water spraying in the hallway simply due to the inside of the water line just getting so thin that when the line charged with water, the water started spraying out the actual pipe, uh, making a little bit of a mess in the hall for us. Luckily, the fire department was quick to get it shut down. <clears throat> and uh, we also had an issue with uh, the voicemail system, uh, the equipment for our voicemail system, which is the entire voicemail system for all three schools is based out of the middle school. So the middle school has the rack with all the equipment that handles the entire phone system for the school. That equipment is outdated and needed to be replaced, $21,516. That is in this year's capital improvements budget that I have put in, proposed to the school board to re replace that. But that comes to $36,916 in upcoming items in addition to the $25,000 just in those two schools alone. I also wanted to add a while back we talked about roofing and our values in roofing and from what I found out in my documentation, it, it appears that we have replaced about half the roofs in on all the schools together. So half the roofs would meet that R six or I'm sorry, R thirty insulation value, but the other half are still assumed to be at like an, I guess like an R9, I believe it was, insulation value on the roof, so um, right at the midway point with that. 
Current year totals for the middle school and Pond Cove, just in maintenance repairs. This does not include um, you know, electric or, or plumbing or anything like that. This is just in repairs that were done at the school. Totals $80,401 as of yesterday. Um, to put that into perspective, the high school is at $43,500. $43,556, just as a comparison. They're similar in size. Middle School in Pine Cove is slightly, slightly larger, but close enough. So I also wanted to, I think we touched on this a little bit last night at the budget meeting that we were having, and wanted to bring this, I think this thing's awesome. It's really effective. The, these, from, from the 1900s to the 2000s, these are all the federal mandated things that, this, that, this, that the uh, federal government requires of the school, um, changes that, that need to be done over the year throughout the school. And up here, I'll just fold it right there, is right about the time where the 1930s building, the middle school, was started operations. 1940s, I, I don't know if most of you know, the fourth grade wing, the, the, the wing closest to the back of the Thomas Memorial Library, I'm being told, was the original elementary school. I don't know if anybody's here long enough to know that, but it was built in the 40s, and, and the fourth grade wing was the original elementary school. They added on going towards the high school then. But anyway, those two buildings were started in this time, and then the remainder is how much it's grown over the years. This does not include state-mandated things as well. So my, my point to this is, over the years, you know, we, we, we've talked about the, uh, I, I've just spent time talking about the mechanical parts of it, but there's also a huge part of, last year we, uh, took some hallway space and created it into some offices in the middle school so they would have enough room for some offices. We're looking to do a similar project for Pond Cove um, in an alcove where there's some lockers. We'll have to remove the lockers and create a, an office meeting space in that area. And that's, that's actually not uncommon for other schools as well. Um, but we're at that point where we have completely run out of space and um, I know the special ed program has requirements set by these mandates where there's more one-on-one -on -one needs with certain students or smaller groups and um, we're, we're going way beyond our abilities to actually meet these needs. So, you know, my question is if, if this is what it looks like in 2000, then what's it going to look like 20 years from now? Um, and can our buildings meet those needs, space needs? I'm not even talking mechanicals. The space needs that are going to be needed in, in the future. It, it's, it's, we need the space now. For, you know, and when, we, when we move uh, people into closets and, and create spaces, those spaces are not designed to typically handle what we're, what we're doing. You know, I can carve a space out here and call it an office, but it has no ventilation or no proper heat or anything like that to, to be functional and, and in certain situations you're not meeting national standards for air quality when uh, when there's a certain amount of people in a room and everybody's exhaling you're creating co2 in a space if that space is too small the co2 will start to affect you with, you know with drowsy and just uncomfortable but could actually get to I, I tell people that's what made Apollo 13 come home you know it, it can get to a toxic level um, we're nowhere near that, but, but the possibility <laughs> yeah. is there when you don't have proper air quality. Um, so, having said all that, I'm going to throw my personal opinion out. Um, I'll call it professional opinion, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, on option number four that the architects have presented, if we were to go with that option, that doesn't really address anything that I've just talked about. It gives us I believe, a new cafeteria and some safety upgrades and a little bit of renovation to the high school. 
but it doesn't address any of the any any of the things that we've talked about over the past months. Um, so to me, option four isn't really an option. And you know, option three I think would be so complicated with the amount of modulars that we need and the disruption that that would cause. You know, with students, students going from class to class and having to put on jackets or, or going to the bathroom and going outside to go to wherever the bathrooms are located and things like that. It's just, I think that would really be counterproductive and expensive. So, to me, I see option one or two as being the only two choices. Questions? I would like to just, um, two things I want to follow up with. Um, thank you very much for that, Perry. Uh, when Perry was showing that elongated, mandated list of things to do, I think it's important is to explain that that really has nothing to do with enrollment, right? It's asking for a lot of one-on-one -on -one or small group and demanding very unique uh, facility sizing and spaces that did not exist before. Right. And so whether our enrollment is staying steady or even going down, that really has nothing to do with the conversation that Perry just had about spacing. And I think that's really important to make it clear. The other thing, and I don't know if you can do this, Jack, just for a visual, can you zoom up so that people, I know it's listed, but this is what Perry is talking about. This, I believe, is uh, 2016. You can see it's pretty steady. And then it starts to jump up to where these unexpected costs are just so enormous and burdensome that I believe that is a big piece of where your professional recommendation is coming. Because you, am I correct, are expecting that to just continue that far next year and the next year and the next year where it becomes not very sustainable. Right. Am right. I correct? Absolutely. So I just think this visual, you can look it up online, it'll all be posted. But I just, people who are watching this, just to get a quick visual of the difference, because I think that's quite profound. So, thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, Tim. So your uh, discussion, first of all, about the moving, Okay, so in, in the, 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 the report that they gave, they, they had this roof. You, you familiar with this? Yeah. So most of it was unknown. Right. Okay, so could you, based on what you just said, about half of this now we know was replaced within the last just few years. Correct. And then there was, there was uh, four different pieces that, that were replaced in 2004. So the additional 50% that you say now was replaced just within the last few years, would that be part of the what is now from our the study that they did was considered unknown? Correct. Okay. So, so if you big go, pieces of this were replaced about 15 years ago, and then 50% of the remainder was replaced within just the last four or five, like three or four years. Yeah, right. So the tune of about two I, I've been here three years, and we haven't done a roof in those three years, but I think the last one was done just prior to my arrival. Could you give us some detail, more detail on the 50% based on, we, we all got kind of copies of this as part of the report. Could you break down which one of these roofs, so I think a pretty big part of this, the roofs have been done within the last certainly 15 years and, and a significant part. Could you break that down for us in a little more detail and provide that to us? Yeah, absolutely. It does seem like a lot of the roofs have been done. I, I can tell you, if anybody just wants to look for yourselves, if you go on Google Maps and look at the satellite picture from above, anything that is a dark black has not been replaced. If it's a light gray, that's a new roof. Um, there is kind of like an off-colored gray in there. That is also an old roof, and it looks off-gray because it's stone. You know, back Years back, they used to put, they call it ballast, but it's basically river stone on top of the roof to hold the roof down. Um, so that picture will also look great, but you can tell it, it's, you can just tell it looks different. Yeah. So, but yeah, I can provide. So the roof that we're, that we know we're done, 
the two and a half, two million plus room, we know those were all at R30 at least. Correct. Okay. So that was so. That was the, the uh, that was the minimum that was called for at that time. Yes. But I think that would be helpful in while we're discussing what we're going to do, uh, that people know how much of the roofs are actually uh, at the at the level that are were required. Okay. So. Would it be beneficial if I just email that to everybody? Well, I think we're, we're trying to work through Donna, I think, or mm -hmm. through the chair. Yeah. Okay. We'll so get to them and get it to us. But. Derek. With, uh, Perry, what's the expected life or life expectancy of a roof? I know they offer you 20 year warranties on a rubber roof, but. I mean, I like to take them to like 30 years if right. we can get it out of it, but uh, yeah, after that, you're kind of. So it, at this it point, declines quickly. some of that, we could be halfway through that. Right, uh, correct. Two thirds to halfway through that process. Right. So halfway, yeah. On some of it. On, on some of it, but yes, on some of okay. it. Okay. Anything else? Right. Well, thank you so much for that. Oh, oh. Uh, can yep. I make a suggestion? Oh, sorry, didn't see you. Oh, that's right. uh, <coughs> I looked into the roofs a little bit. And um, when we did the high school for almost $2 million, I think it was in May and 7, for example, you, the town did the right thing in my view. They hired Walter Bashtoff as a roofing consultant to come up with the specs, and he oversaw the, the, the uh, application. <clears throat> Since we're not really sure what's up there for the balance that hasn't been done, I would encourage that it would be worthwhile to <clears throat> spend the money, hire him, because I know he's top flight, and get his assessment of the, <clears throat> the remaining rules that may need to be done in the life expectancy. The other point I'd like to make, <clears throat> make is I own about 200,000 square feet of warehouse space. <clears throat> and what we do every year in the fall, <clears throat> we send up the roofing company. And whatever needs to be done, they do it <clears throat> and uh, on repairs or replacements. And it's <clears throat> um, it extends the life significantly. And that should have been done in the past. If it hasn't been done, we ought to inst <coughs> institute um, professional people to do that. Thank you. Thank you. We do do that. We do a contract with Tech to America. And they come in and do similar. It's basically across the entire town, not just the schools. They come in and inspect all the roofs and submit an annual report to me, and then I budget to have that So here's what we're doing now is um, we're going to break up into small groups again like we did last time uh, and review and talk about the positives and the negatives of each, uh, each of these options. Um, um, yeah, so you'll need to take your sheet with you. And this is how, I don't know my notes are going to correct me if I'm wrong. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to break up like we did before. And then instead of coming back and having Donna write everything down, we're going to combine two groups so that we then have a, a medium-sized group. And somebody from each group will write it down. And then we'll put those posters up and they can present it to the other groups. I'll talk you through this just don't worry. Um, yeah. So I would just like to say I'm concerned that this isn't a very transparent process. We're recording this presumably for the public, but the public can't see or hear what is going on in the small groups. And I think it's great to use small groups for icebreaking kinds of activities, but when we're looking at making a recommendation to the town, it seems to me that we ought to be speaking publicly about the pros and cons of each option around this table so that it can be recorded and so that the town can see it rather than in small groups. And I just want to state it for the record. I raised it earlier. I understand this is the process that you want to go through. But I at least want to state for the record and for the public that I don't think this is a very transparent process. 
Thank you for sharing your opinion. Do others have that concern? I have a question for you. Will it make a difference if this was held at the town hall and be available via local TV? I think it... Or do you have another recommendation? My recommendation is that we sit around this large table as a large group and share our um, pros and cons. So that's my recommendation. Okay. That it's one group and it can be easily accessed and accessible and transparent. So we are going to do that, right? At the end. Yeah. So it, yeah. it seems to me that we are going to summarize. Well, I don't think we are because we as members, it's going to be filtered through some little speaker for our group and there'll be all kinds of little yellow stickies and something is lost in the translation. So I don't think it's the same. I think it's qualitatively different. I don't want to prolong the evening. I just wanted to state for the record that I don't view this as a very transparent process and my recommendation. But I am happy to go along with the groups wanting to do it another way. I have a comment. Maybe we can, we can help kind of come to a compromise on the issue. So I don't feel like, I'm not a participant in this committee, so I'm a school board member and the committee will make a recommendation to us. So when I'm in the small group, I don't feel comfortable. Um, I'm not in that group as a, as a persuasive voice. I'm more of a listener. So I mean, maybe to, to that end, we would say anyone who's part of the school board would, would take, a, take a listening role in the small groups. And, and then the committee is there to sort of do their committee work and we would be, I mean, that's, it's an option. Um, because I do think, you know, to the extent someone might be campaigning for a particular issue within a group, it's not, it, you know, it might be perceived to be, un, you know, not, you know, they're not vocalizing in a way that the public can see that they're doing it in a Just a suggestion. I also would like to say that I, I I feel like the last time we did this in our last meeting, when we did come around, um, though there was one person that was the spokesperson for the group, anybody in the group spoke up, and I remember that happening several times. If they felt like their voice wasn't heard or wasn't communicated um, effectively or appropriately, um, so thank you for your comment. Thank you for your concern. Yes, Tom. Well, I'm just reflecting on what. I think it would be a more collaborative effort if we all sit around the table and talk back and forth. I think it would be much more productive than doing it, doing it in silos. I just, you know, this is, this is a very significant issue, the direction you're taking. And I think the public needs to know about it and they should understand how, it just if they choose, come to the meetings and be involved. And, and uh, I think it's, it would be much more beneficial if we all sit around the table and talk about it instead of off in sections. Thank you. Just as a thought, <coughs> looking at the population here this evening, about half of us are staff. <coughs> um, just putting it out there because you have members who are citizens of the town. You know, you, I don't live here as yeah. well, so I'm just thinking about, I mean, last time it was a much larger group as well, so I'm just trying to think about the challenges. I think that's something that you might want to consider when it comes to it. In favor of a larger group discussion, yeah, because there are so many staff members that would be, and less yeah, that would, townspeople. That would be my thought on that, just be, to consider that when you, as you decide, yeah. not knowing what, how many folks are going to be here and how many are going to be at the hockey game tonight yeah. or what have you. But and the one-act play. And the one-act play. And the one-act play tonight so as well. Just, yeah. just as a consideration, but I think, you know, looking at uh, Mary Ann's point and just, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of staff heavy tonight. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, just, just a consideration. Yeah. No, I'm willing to consider that. Are there other, Tim, did you have any Well, I just think we, we only have, we have somewhat limited time and, and breaking up into group, small groups and then getting into a little bit larger group and then ultimately getting into back all together. Uh, it just seems like we, we could probably be a little bit more efficient in the time tonight if we just stay together. I understand one of the reasons you were concerned about 
putting us into smaller groups where people might not feel comfortable sharing with a large group, and I want to be sensitive to that, but if, if maybe people could give, if, if there is some people that wouldn't feel comfortable sharing in this size group, I'd probably lean a little bit more, but if, if everybody's comfortable, I look around, I don't see too many, I see Troy over there, I don't think he's a shrinking violet. <laughs> 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 If we could keep together, I think we could maybe be more efficient with our time. Thank you for that. Um, could, could I just say one other thing, too? I think it's relevant for the public's understanding to understand who is advocating for what as well. If in your small groups it turns out that it's employees advocating for option one, the 80 plus million dollar project, and it is people who are taxpayers who are advocating for option four, I think that's very relevant to the public's understanding of the issues before this town. And I'm not sure that that's all going to come out very clearly if we go into small groups and it sort of gets laundered and filtered. So I, with that, I will just stop belaboring it. I apologize. Um, thanks. I was, I was also, I just want to speak to a moment that why we were doing the small groups. Um, and maybe part of it was so that people who were shy could have a voice, but that wasn't my, my drive for it. My drive that was that it actually could be more effective and useful of the time, that more people could be able to speak, and then they could come up with what what they wanted to say, filter it out a little bit, and then present to the whole group. So I thought, we thought, I think, in our discussion that um, it would actually stimulate more conversation and actually be more efficient. Um, so I just, I just want to be clear. I, w I wasn't trying to sort of make it comfortable for shy little violets like Troy, um, <laughs> necessarily. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, maybe a little bit, but so that everybody's voices can be heard, because sometimes there is a more dominant voice in a group, and it can be a little bit harder to speak up. So maybe that, w that was definitely a little bit of it. But the idea also was to be able to have these rich conversations, you know, first in the smaller group and then coming to the medium sized group and then once again to the whole group and continue to process and just and, and, and hear different opinions and, and talk it out instead of in many ways what, what I was thinking was a slower process of you know one person speaking at a time. At the same time I can hear that um, that some people have concerns about that not being transparent. But uh, just I, there was absolutely no intention there to not be transparent. There was intention to stimulate more conversation and know that everybody, once back in the whole group, always has the opportunity to, to speak. Um, so, Thank other you, comments? Nick, yeah. I just want to look up. I think maybe I forgot if I'm wrong, is uh, objecting to small group. If, if we had two cameras and two groups, we would have been fine. Am I correct about that? I think that makes it more transparent yeah. that there's a record. So she's there. Yeah. She's more interested about right. Right, and I can hear that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nancy. I hear that. Anything else? I'd be more inclined to, to have a large group tonight. I, I, mean, I have the utmost respect for the people who work in the buildings, and I, I don't. I'd really like to hear what they what they say, and if if they're comfortable saying. I mean, they they said it in all the when we did all the studies a year ago and all those field visits, I mean, they were actively involved in, in saying that, and that's out there on the record too. So it's not like it's not like they're spending the town's money. It's just let's understand from their perspective what they feel is the right the right option for the kids and for and for the staff as well. So I think that that's a that would be helpful. And I think the town might be curious to, to hear what each what some of the professionals say too. Okay. Any other comments or I just uh, looking around if there's maybe five people here that are not on the school board town council or work in the schools and I, I think if we were at our full capacity um, the smaller groups 
made more sense, but I think perhaps with the makeup that we have here tonight, it, it maybe is an, not a, a fair situation to put those individual people in a group with three or four people that are mm -hmm. <coughs> schools. And Seems like it's, group. Yeah, it seems like it's the will of the group mm -hmm. to stay yeah. in a group. So, um, do we want me to write down notes? Do we just want to have discussion? There's the other option is that we can just have discussion and I can work yeah. on minutes. Yeah, but we have it on the um, video. So. And we have it on the video. So, um, I'll take a few notes, but we won't use the big sticky notes and bring it together. Um, but I would like some sort of organization through this, and so the way I'm thinking about this is that um, we do have a, a while, it's only 7.10, um, to go through each, uh, each option, positives first and then negatives, and then move on to the second option, or would we like to do positives for all four and then negatives for all four? I, I say go with an option and do positive and negative. Um, is everybody comfortable with that? Sure. Great. Thanks. And thanks everybody for being willing to switch gears and voice your opinions and um, be open to change. So starting with Can option. Just, sorry, ask one. Thing. Yes. Because in the presentation from the um, consultants, it started off at the high school, right? As the maybe priority thing, and then it, it then it went to the older buildings. So before we start with the option, if is it de does everyone agree that the high school should take the back burner now? I guess is, is one of my questions. And only because when I first started, it was the high school, the high school, yeah. and then it kind of. So thank you. One of the things that thanks Jim, right? Yep. Um, one of the things that we were going to bring up before the meeting ended tonight was to say, and and actually this is probably a good time to do it now act, instead of afterwards. Is um, so this is a process, and when the engineers came up and architects, they came up with an initial option a year and a half ago, which is similar to option four, which is the new cafetorium and a little bit of redoing around the safety and the entryway. Um, and then things morphed a little bit, and you're right, they came up with the idea of, well, let's do the high school because of thinking of the high school as your focal point, and we want to have that be the big cell and, and that the community might back around that. Um, and then it did shift down to the Pond Cove and Middle School being the, the focus on the options. Something, uh, so yes, as it stands right now, the, the idea is Pond Cove and the Middle School and the high school would follow. Would follow, yeah. not being forgotten, but not right at this moment. Um, and so one of the questions that we wanted to pose to the committee is, Last time we talked about, these are just four options, and Colby and company and um, Simon Architects told us that several times. They could come up with other options. Um, we don't have to use any of these options. So part of the question that we wanted to ask tonight as we go through and have this discussion is, um, is there one of these options that we can take off the table and simplify? That as a majority, we, we can agree with and say, yeah, that's not, feasible, probably one of the bookends of it, in, in my imagination. Um, and are we not comfortable with any of these, and would we like them to come back with a fifth option or a sixth option? So maybe that's where the conversation should begin. Or should we begin or with the, we well, Or do I, we have other ideas well, that we would like to share with them? The place yeah. I'd like to begin is what can we afford? Um, you know, Perry's a pretty strong proponent of option uh, 71 to 77 million based on your comments earlier and I don't really understand that one I mean based based on what Mike I mean what Matt has laid out for us as far as what the town can responsibly borrow and maybe I just don't understand how this works but I had understood we could borrow somewhere between 27 and 32 with I think we got about five million coming off the books that we could replace over the next few years, if I remember, Matt. So that could get us up to 32. 
So how is it that we're even can, option number two that's going to be 71 to 77 million, basically over time knocking them all down? As Marianne said, fill in the so a landfill somewhere with all that rubble. And but how do we afford 71 to 77? If somebody could explain that one to me, then I keep option two on the books. But if if we and that's also the one that takes the longest for us to get done. One of the things I'm a little concerned about is how long this is going to take before we even get a shovel in the ground. Um, if we went with what we originally were talking about before we came up with the two, three, and the four, was uh, somewhere around 27 million, fix the building, fix the school, build a new cafeteria for the middle school in the Pond Cove, utilize that other space for other stuff, maybe some of those offices that you need. But that, you know, when you're looking at that one, we've got construction would take place the summer of 22, and that's the earliest we're going to get at this. Um, so can somebody explain to me how 71 to 77 is an option for the town? I don't understand that. So I don't know if other people have that same question in their mind about the cost of it, but um, I'd, I'd really like to, uh, to understand that. And you've already explained it. <laughs> so if somebody else could, uh, maybe they could offer the counter of what the town manager has come up with, a, what keeping our good credit ratings, um, putting an option on the table that's over two times what seems to be our upper limit. Can I just, Matt, can you just recap that discussion? Because it's not fresh in my mind. Sure, sure. I can, I can. Do my best. I was trying to call it back up and realized I was completely. <laughs> I should have warned you about. I should have warned you about this before. Yeah, um, you, know, uh, you know, more or less. Uh, I'll give you the Reader's Digest uh, condensed on it, but uh, more or less looking at conversations I had with our barn uh, syndicator Joe Quartara, Morrison Gabbett, who's done all that work for us. He kind of gave me some ranges that we're looking at as far as per capita amount of debt that you might look at. It was roughly two to three thousand dollars per per person. Uh, not per household, but per person. That's kind of the acceptable range. Or uh, additional ways we're looking at it was like the statu statutory limits would show that it's up to 10% can be applied for, for school debt. So that's roughly it was like 300 and some odd million dollars would like the ceiling. Um, but also another area we're looking at, I think, was two to or three to four percent of. Uh, Bottom line is, but ultimately, when it all came down to looking at the allowable percentages as, as to what the bond markets looked at and found acceptable without adversely impacting the bond rating, you're looking at roughly a range of about 27 million to about 30, I think 32 to 35 million. And over the next few years, we do have bonds that are going to be retiring, so that will change as that picture evolves and maybe as this progress goes forward. So by 22, 23, you could add even more to that, but it to be in like a, a safe zone or one area that would not impact it, uh, your bond rating at least, which means that you have to pay a higher amount in, in interest on when you do go out to syndicate bonds. It means you, you can still go above that if you want to, but you'll have to pay a higher interest rate ultimately for in the future for other areas that you may want to go with bonds and indebtedness for. So that's kind of the, the really condensed uh, version of it. I can provide the spreadsheets that I have on it for you. Uh, is there like a second tier of not ideal but still okay bond rating borrowing capacity? Yeah. It's it's certainly acceptable. Uh, Yarmouth is probably the best example of what's happened recently. They have, you know, they went well over and above that a uh, year and a half ago when they approved a, a fairly large bond package of I think sixty some odd million dollars is what they approved. So they probably overshot that. They also have a lower bond rating. Uh, probably as we, probably as a result of that and other things, it depends upon what the community will accept for indebtedness as well. So you could come forward with a package, you know, to the voters, and if they approve it, then you know, I think a lot of people are surprised that Yarmouth voters did approve that level of indebtedness, but they did. Um, so it's just a question of bringing that, bringing something forward that you know, the voters will ultimately approve, but. Those levels that they have that are set statutorily, uh, saying that you cannot exceed a certain amount for overall indebtedness or a certain levels to the school, those are hard and fast numbers where it comes to uh, what the what the state has set by by law. But that number is like 
300. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah, it's that, and that we're not even talking right. close it's to that. What we were looking at that side of it was kind of like, as I equated it to, was taking the kids' college fund, all your home equity, all your credit cards back, and putting them on some other table in Oxford versus you know, doing what you might find as a responsible thing. So it could be somewhere, I know it's something less than that, but the, but what they would find to not impact it was kind of like that that level that what Joe had identified. And it ranged somewhere between 27 to, to mid-30s. I just have one follow-up question. The, the difference in interest rate that you'd be looking at if the bond rate was impacted, what, what is that roughly? Probably half a point to a point. But over 20 years on X amount of million dollars, a cut here and a cut here adds up to a few, a few extra million. At the same time, going up to the bond market versus doing like the main bond bank, you're going to get better, rank, better rates on the open market than you will through the main bond bank. So um, there's different ways to look at it. But, uh, but ultimately, uh, I have to a full point over that 20 year to 30 year bond is what you're, what you're looking at. Any questions to follow that? Is there a recommended level of indebtedness to ensure that you're spending the right amount in your town so you're not left with a, in a situation where you know you have a $100 million hole one day? And have we been below that? It seems to me what you were showing me, it's, yeah. it's, we're in great fiscal health. We have not a lot of debt. It's extremely low, I know, uh, compared to Michigan yeah. around the state, probably one of the lowest. Yeah. Um, and have we, and I just, it's just a question I have, have we not been spending money that we should have been spending to the extent that, that we're getting to this point? Because one concern I have is, is, is spending money, even if we do a lower amount, and maybe that's what the group decides to do, but then we're back here five years from now, or 10 years from now. You know, I, I've got kids who are just starting school, so I, I'm gonna be here a long time, and after that, and I don't wanna have to keep on having to have bonds that are sort of band-aid approaches. Um, well, and so I'm trying to get a sense of that, just because I think it'll help inform our decision, which is, have we been spending adequately on maintenance, essentially, and upkeep of these buildings? Or and maybe we have, but I didn't know. I, 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 I don't think we have. Right? I mean, I think that's part of why that's we are here today. If, if, if you the bar graph shows the yeah. massive ramp up is because ultimately, and it's not, I and mean, it's not specific to Cape Elizabeth. You can talk right. to school boards across the state, and you'll find that but you, but your, but your capital expenditures always get the uh, get cannibalized yeah. at the expense for uh, trying to make sure that you're maximizing your, your, your product in the, in the classroom. So right. uh, that's a challenge. So I probably talked about as far as what the levels of the, the, the state has certain minimums that they have out there recommendations, but. Uh, if they keep them in a unique position that they try to pay uh, and invest as, they, as it's gone along. Is a comment on that? Yeah. Just um, as a population is aging and we're looking to replace citizens, tax paid citizens, as a uh, younger person with children in the school, I don't look at the bond rating of a town when I'm looking to move there. I look at the school system. and is the school nice and well tested and is it a place you want to send my kid? I don't honestly, I've never, and I'm an architect so I'm going to probably talk a lot tonight so bear with me. Um, I've never talked to anybody looking to buy property who talks about the bond rating or the fiscal stability of a town. You care about the schools and, and, and the, yes the tax rate but if you want a good school you have to pay taxes. That's simply what it is. So. And, you know, it's, 70, it's a $77 million project to replace the schools, which need to be replaced. Right? Do we have an option? I mean, if the schools are falling down and are unhealthy environments for our children, people aren't going to move here to pay the $29 million bond. I mean, it's, it's not, those two are, I think, important to keep in mind that, you know, I understand and I'm perhaps not the most fiscally responsible person. Um, but that's the draw to the town, is the schools and the beaches. <laughs> One second, Mary Ann. Can I clarify a question? There is the, there is the 300 and something cap of bond borrowing. And then there is the recommendation 
or is it AAA rating that is positive? And what was that around? I'm forgetting, like 29? 27 to 25, right in that range. Right in that range. But that doesn't mean that we can't go above that. Like, we can borrow $71 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. It, it, it is there to borrow. It just changes things a little bit. And what it does is it takes us out of perfect standing, um, which it, maybe to follow along what the gentleman was saying is, what does that matter if our kids are in buildings that are falling apart and in five years we're coming back, we're just kicking the can down the road and maybe it's that much more expensive. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's kind of also like looking at the big picture, looking at the future, and looking at the responsibility. Um, like, we, we can borrow that money. And by the time all this happens, my kids are going to be out of here, right? Like, out of the schools. I'm, and so I'm, I'm like others that will be paying for other kids' children. Um, but, but it's the responsibility. So I, I'm not benefiting from it. Maybe grandkids someday. I don't know. But um, but 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 I just feel like it's the responsible thing to do. And 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 if you look at if you've been in the schools these days, or you you, you hear what's happening with these kids, and and um, you you understand the, the 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 situations. And you know we we heard. I know we we're going to talk about this next time. But Dell stood up there. I don't know, was it like an hour it felt like? I'm just exaggerating. <laughs> it might have been like 10 or 15, I'm exaggerating. But for like 10 or 15 minutes going back to that, that what is mandated and all the, the rooms that he needs, like these kids that we are caring for and they are learning it and the teachers are teaching and, and, and then things are falling apart and we're trying to keep up but how do you keep up? Where is that chart that Perry gave us? Like, how do you keep up with, with that? And then it's, and then where is it going to be in five years? Where is it going to be in ten years? What's mandated? When the money is there to borrow, and maybe it stretches us a little bit. But what is the other solution? What is the other option to kick the can down the road for? five or ten years and another set of parents deal with this and it's worse and it becomes an emergency and yes I know that maybe the shovel doesn't happen until summer 2022 but it's a big project that needs to be planned and that, that's just the way it has to be so I just wanted to say that that the money is there it's a big lump of money and and we can borrow it um, and we've been in conversation with the town about um, you know, the town hall is not going to be replaced, but there's also been all these bonds that have happened for all these town things, a new library, which I know wasn't as expensive, what else was on that, you know, and, and fire department, and there's been nothing for the schools. Can I, I need to respond to a few things. The fire department and public works all took place before the kindergarten wing, and the high school renovation, the last two major projects for the schools came after. But, so I think it's important to be careful about our facts. And one of the questions, and Tim, thank you for. Well, I'm going on the slide, excuse me, that he, that Matt had presented okay, about what was but, there. So I am going on facts. There, there was a question that maybe we aren't spending enough, have we not been spending enough? And I go back to the architect's report, very recent, which stated that overall the physical conditions of all the buildings, particularly given the age, is functionally satisfactory. That means that basic needs are being met. Can we spend more money? Of course we can. We always can. Do I want to spend more money? I absolutely do. My children are not in the school anymore. My grandchildren will be very soon. I want to have a good building, but I'm glad that Tim raised the questions he raised because we have to focus on what we can afford as a town and also what can pass in referendum as a town. And that's my concern. The first library project that went out did not pass in referendum. 
And so I think we have to work hard to justify the work that needs to be done, and we have to make sure we've sharpened our pencils as much as we can, because it will be up to us to sell the project to the town. And I was on the last school, kindergarten and high school renovation committee 20 years ago because I'm older than dirt. But um, those of us who were on the committee stuck around and we worked on the campaign and sold the kindergarten wing when there was, there was not a uniform view of that, although by the time it got to the council, I was glad to say we had a, a unanimous vote of the council, which was very important in putting that out to referendum. So I, I think it's, it's important that we come up with something that all of us around the table can say the work needs to be done and it should be done and this is the amount that we think it will cost and we're ready to fight for that um, in public. So I think you asked a very good question, Tim, and I'm glad you did. I look at these options and it's interesting, Perry said he can see only one good option and that's option one. And I look at it and I say, based on what Matt has reported to us, about 27 million and then maybe having five to 10 million. I thought the number was closer to 10 million, but maybe five to 10 million getting paid down, that maybe we're in the 30 to 35 million range as something that is doable. So that leaves me feeling, unlike Perry, that only option one makes sense, that only option four makes sense. Or maybe an option that's more like option three, because those are closer to the numbers that Matt's talked to about in terms of um, um, responsible borrowing. And sure, people don't ask what our bond rating is, but people do ask. They want to know that the schools are good. We want them to be good. But they also ask what the taxes are. And how much you borrow translates directly into what your taxes are. And we also want to make sure that we have the money to attract and retain and pay good teachers. Because as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing is attracting and retaining good teachers and paying them because they're the real key. And I want them in, I want everyone in a safe building, but I don't want there to be such a budget crunch that we can't be doing the things we need to do every year to attract and retain good teachers as well. I, I agree with that. I think the teachers are you know, really so much of what make our schools in our nurses. Our and our nurses um, but, and guidance um, counselors. <laughs> I, um, I, I think your environment is, is a critical piece to that. And, um, you know, pay only goes so far when you're walking into a space every day that um, is uninspiring and, you know, doesn't feel great. And, and, you know, everything ages. So even if it's fresh and shiny now, it, it eventually will be older. Um, but I do think at some point people do make a decision that, um, you know, I, I can stay here or I could work in an environment that every day I might feel, you know, a little, a little better. I, I went to a conference and um, <laughs> I, I, a phenomenal teacher, like one I would be devastated if, if the teacher left the district. Um, and the walls had, um, water had been coming in through the walls and ceiling, so she was bringing over papers to show my child, and I would show me <laughs> what my child had been doing, and they were soaking wet, and you know, they were just stored where you, they were stored, and um, it's disheartening, I would imagine, when, you know, the, that's your environment for a good part of your day every day. <laughs> Um, so I think it is critical that we need to look out and see what do we think the voters will support because we don't want to spend a lot of time rehashing through decisions and then putting out a bond and putting out a pass. So 
part of what I, I'm interested to hear more opinions from the committee because this shouldn't just be the same voices and us talking about about what our opinions are. So I, I would invite more opinions. So I really want to hear anyone else who has a burning desire to share their. <laughs> I thank, thank you to the citizen who commented. I mean, I... I my next question, I haven't seen any... This is my first meeting, so I'm, I'm playing catch up. I apologize, everybody. But there's been no... Have, um, before you start up, can you share your name? Uh, my name is James Beasley. Okay, thank you. I have a kindergartner and a second grader. Um, I've lived here for four years. They pay a lot of taxes. They're not overwhelmingly high in this town compared to anywhere else I've lived. So, that aside, uh, I would like to reiterate your statement about creating the built environment for people that can be inspiring. And I think that is one of the most critical things for retaining teachers. It, it is not nice to work in environments that are without daylight, without fresh air, full of mold and full of water. It's just not healthy for either for learning or for teaching. And that, I think, is a big draw and pushes people away and has affected my employment on more than one occasion. Um, I had another salient point. Oh, operating costs. If we were to make a building, and full disclosure, I work for a zero energy architecture firm. If we make a healthy building that is, uses half the energy cost to run it, to run the building, which is physically possible, I mean, that is something that I think could help financially. I imagine the cost of heating and running the plant here is significant. And if you could have that, use renewable energy sources to deteriorate or eliminate most of your costs of um, running the school, that is a fiscal possibility that could help to sell the bond. I mean, it's just, you know, the operating cost, not just the maintenance cost, but the yearly cost of running, heating, cooling, then we don't cool, but would it be? That's my other thing. That just it would be a nice thing to have addressed once you pick an option of, of something that is that could help. It's a good teaching tool and environmentally responsible and, and speaks well for the town in the future. I'm kind of working at is that, and I will say, I think maybe this is a generational thing, but I have a very different attitude towards debt. I think my generation has a huge amount of education debt. <laughs> um, so maybe we're, we're just a little more used to taking borrowing in a way that's not necessarily fiscally responsible, but sort of just what we've had to do to enter the workforce. Um, but I think, so looking at the options, I look at option Four as not making much sense. Yes, it makes financial sense, but it seems like money not well spent. <clears throat> Option three similarly seems like it's going to be more money. It's not fiscally responsible um, under the terms that Matt laid out, and it doesn't really get us what we need. So in my mind, options one and two are the options. Given that we do need the same, that they get us to the same place, and option two for a little bit less money, even though it's a larger upfront cost, seems to me the best option. But what I would want to see when we actually start getting into the nitty gritty is that we're not going all out, that you know, we're not going for the Mercedes Benz choices in the schools, but maybe we're looking more at like the Lexus level, or maybe even like. <laughs> Toyota Corolla level where we can so that if we can if we can bring the number down, borrow what we need to borrow, but spend responsibly. That's I think where I land on this. I would say absolutely. Yeah. And I think when we a, a couple of years ago when we looked at, you know, the renovations proposed previously, a lot of them seemed like Mercedes Benz type re renovations and that to me as a, a council member, but also as a resident, was a little bit unpalatable. So I think in order to, to make this um, 
easier to digest for the residents, we, we want to show that, yes, this is something that needs to be done. It's not entirely the most fiscally responsible choice, but we're going to be careful with your money. So, so I tend to agree with what you just said. Um, when I think of option four, I just think about all the things that are out there on the website as to what was said about music room, the science labs, the AD stuff, the special education stuff, the library, the heating, the, the, the roofs, all that stuff. And I just think for 26 to 29 million dollars, you're throwing good money after bad. So that's why I would, I personally would eliminate option four. The thing about option three that strikes me is the complete disruption of, uh, of the kids and the teaching and the learning with portables, and that just strikes me about that. And plus it's, you're showing 53 to 58 million dollars, which is a lot of money. Um, I was originally thinking option one would be more interesting because you know, construction costs are so dicey out there, the last thing we want to have is you know, a project that gets out of control, so maybe we want to take it in, in small pieces, school by school. But uh, I'm also attracted to option two because we might save $10 million, roughly speaking. Um, to do it in a shorter time frame. Uh, I know there are people in the room who are much more familiar with construction costs and what's going on. It, it's not gonna go away. These costs just simply are not gonna go away. They're, they're gonna continue to rise. So I'm inclined to go with option one and, or one or one or two. And a lot can happen between, you know, 10 years. Phase one, occupation 2023, phase two, 2033. But absolutely, all this stuff goes out the window unless we get some pro forma numbers as to what it's gonna cost the average household in here. We'll cut it out. Um, and it's gotta be sold and sold and sold. It's gotta be sold by town council, through town council, but, and, and then ultimately to the residents because this isn't, we've talked about it, this is not, this is not a, for the schools. This is a one-time concept. This is big tent stuff. This is, this is for the town, not simply for the schools. And I think it's, you know, we'll have our work cut out for us, but I also think that, you know, we need to see what people want to afford, what we think we can afford. I would be an advocate for <clears throat> option four um, with a couple of conditions. Can you just speak um, up a little bit? Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you just? I'm I, sorry, I it's been a long day for me. I know, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I would be an advocate for option four. Okay. Four, <clears throat> and the reason, a number of reasons. One is, uh, I have a sense, and I'm pretty certain I'm correct on this. Is uh, we're having an influx of out-of-staters and people from Hawaii coming in to Greater Portland and Cape Elizabeth with all children. And they're retiring in the metropolitan areas, or thinking of retiring and buying homes up here. They call them dark houses because they're here three to six months <clears throat> a year. And they could easily get up here with an hour, hour and a half of Washington, D.C. or New York City or wherever get to the airport here in 20 minutes, they're living in Cape Elizabeth. And we all know this community is very desirable. And you have <clears throat> great health care, some of the best health care in New England, six miles away. So <clears throat> in my view, you've already, you've, your enrollments have dropped from over 1,800 down to just shy of uh, 1,600, 1,550. In my view, <clears throat> I think you're going to see an acceleration of homes that are sold to retirees or adults without any children. So enrollment's going to continue dropping. 
And I wouldn't be at all surprised in eight or ten years you're down to probably not a thousand, but you're probably down to twelve hundred. And so then you do the math on that, and I think I read someplace that <clears throat> on the state figures 140 square feet per child. And so if you have 1,200, yeah, <clears throat> um, down to 1,200, you're probably looking at around 150,000 square feet, maybe 107, and I think we're well over 250 right now. So <clears throat> we very likely are going to have a lot of extra space in these buildings that, way that the citizens are going to have to carry vacant. And <clears throat> so there's big changes occurring, and I see it, and I know it and I can't quantify it. So my suggestion is <clears throat> one of the first things we should do is hire a very prominent outside consultant to do the demographics and project where we're going to be over the next 10 years. And then once we have that, then we can determine the demand on the um, buildings here and <clears throat> what we truly need to uh, deliver a first-class facility to today in 10 years out. The other thing is we're paying off a lot of debt in about eight years, and I would suggest that we look forward to <clears throat> some really hard work, planning, work on the budgets, with the anticipation of being under construction closer to uh, uh, 2028 rather than today, because that's when that debt's being paid off, and you'll have a lot more latitude on, on your renovations. Um, I think there are <clears throat> uh, very definitely some priorities immediately. One is uh, safety and security to the buildings. Uh, the cafeteria over at um, Pond Cove in the middle school, I think that should be done soon. But <clears throat> a lot of this stuff is cosmetics and <clears throat> um, re repairs. There's a lot of deferred maintenance, I understand, um, because of the <clears throat> cutbacks on the budgets from the state. But a lot of the stuff wasn't done, it should have been done, and now we're paying for it. And I can see the spike, but I own a number of buildings that are 50 years old. And you anticipate that, and you budget for it, and <clears throat> you uh, have a preventive maintenance schedule that was not adhered to. And now we as taxpayers are paying for it. And then, in some respects, I don't think you, <clears throat> because you didn't take care of it, do you, have you really earned the right to go to the citizens and, and ask them to spend fifty, seventy million dollars. I, I, it's been maybe not in this room, but mismanaged in the past, and that troubles me. Um, but I think the first step is um, to have an outside consultant figure out where we're going to be student-wise over the next ten years, and then and then come up with a budget that we can all easily afford and work from that budget for the um, improvements to the schools. Um, and um, we, uh, uh, it's my understanding there are families in town that are really stressed, and I think it's those are the people we have to be concerned about financially. And, and you have a lot of retirees. We have the oldest demographics in the state of Maine here, and these people are on fixed income. So we, um, the schools are important, but so are they. Thank you. Is there somebody who has not spoken up that has some benefit? I'll, I'll just uh, I don't know, give my. Th I'm, I'm a structural engineer and I. Uh, moved my family from the Boston area uh, summer of 2018 and um, we fell in love with our house that's you didn't know Kate Elizabeth but then everyone said oh you're moving to like one of the best school systems um, having said that when I first came to Pond Cove because I had a daughter entering kindergarten I will say I was very underwhelmed at the school um, nothing it's it has a great reputation and everything but the building itself is could, doesn't really tell itself, or it's not new, flashy, it's old and dated. Um, and I'm, I've, I'm working on many schools in, in the Boston area, and it's, I, think, I think it's time that we yeah, devote the money to the schools. I think the kids 
deserve to have newer facilities um, just based on the projects. One of them is like Arlington High School and Arlington Massachusetts. It's a very flashy architect. It's, it's maybe even Mercedes Benz, and we don't need that. But I think I think the schools um, could, yeah, definitely. I, I would vote for option one or two. I don't know. Maybe there's a way to do a combination as a structural engineer. Like perhaps there's certain wings that we could keep. If there's, I don't, I don't know the history of like which wing, the kindergarten wings most recent. Perhaps, perhaps the structure of a certain wing could be saved, and we could have a combination of um, option four, where you do build build some a new cafeteria and auditorium in the courtyard, and maybe you prioritize if the middle school is the oldest. Perhaps we definitely build a new middle school, but maybe there's ways to save costs and renovate portions of Pond Cove if, if we're going to keep like the corridors and the classrooms, if that skeleton structure, and you know maybe we just focus on maybe a new boy, a new mechanic, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but perhaps a new mechanical central plant can go somewhere in the courtyard and then we could keep the structure but renovate the mechanical systems or I don't know, there's different options perhaps that we could explore to bring these numbers maybe down a little. Just, just throwing ideas out there, but um, I, I would, I would agree that coming from the Boston area and everyone telling me the schools are beautiful, I was a little underwhelmed when I saw the, the facility itself. But not to say I've been very pleased with Pond Cove so far. So. I'd be happy to speak to that as well. So uh, this is my fourth school district that I've worked in, um, and I worked in places where we were in really bad facilities and actually moved into a new building. Um, I have visitors in my band room all the time from other schools, um, and they are shocked when they come into our middle school because they hear Cape Elizabeth, and we've got these good programs, but they're like, this is where you teach. Mm -hmm. I have a bucket in my room because there's a leak that when the furnace shuts off, the water's wet, water runs, it floods my part of my room. And Do my, you have room for that bucket? <laughs> <laughs> Barely. Uh, my coworker actually, basically from November through March, wears a wool hat in her room and a heat vest. Jack can attest to that because he's right next door to her. It's not because she has bad circulation, it's because it's so cold in her room. So they're not cosmetic issues. It, the environment is a very hard place to work. We had students at an honors festival this weekend. We are at South Portland High School and my students come and they're like, oh, we can walk in the halls and we're not being like shoved on top of each other. Um, in lunch duty today, one of my coworkers whispered to me, I hate to say this, but it feels like we're like on prison guard duty in the lunchroom, and it really does. It's a, I'm not talk, just talking about the teacher standpoint from the students. We are smushed. It's at capacity, and it's not, I think our buildings are dictating what we can do and what we cannot do in our programming, and it just makes it really challenging. There's a lot of things, and I know Troy can speak to that, that we'd like to do as a school, and we just don't have the space and it might not be we have the square footage but we don't have the actual space within that square footage to do the things we need to do with our students um, so the cost and all of that I can't speak to but it is a challenging environment to work in and and it's one of those things that good teachers do look at we had several years ago a teacher looking at a position in our school and they were the candidate and they looked at our facilities and they turned it down so I, I think that is something to, to keep in the back of our minds. Those facilities do matter for staff and the environment and kind of our outlook and how we present ourselves to our students. Mm -hmm. When we come into school and we're cold all day, that makes it hard. And then our students are as well. Um, and I, I apologize. I have to make some counterpoints to the gentleman to my left. Um, Anecdotally, I think the the survey of the projected age and demographics of the town would be a very interesting thing to have. I agree. Anecdotally, my experience is the antithesis. Yes, it's the people from New York, it's the people from Boston, it's the people from DC who still work in those towns. And they take the jet into Portland and they're here on the weekends, and their income far exceeds anything that you can get in the greater Portland area. I don't know about the retirees coming up, because it's not my age group. I'm not physically concerned about the tax burden on the retirees who choose to sell and fly to 
in and out of New York to Portland. That if that's their decision to move to a town. That's it. People on a fixed income who have been here, that is a concern. And I agree. And I appreciate your pointing out the issues we need to discuss when trying to sell the bond to the town. Again, if we want to attract talent to the school, and the schools are very good, right? So kids are learning great. Thank you. Um, <coughs> We have to have facilities that are, are reasonable, and it's not remarkable. And it's not fair to punish the people who are here now, paying their taxes, to go to the schools because of deferred maintenance from people 50 years ago. That's not, that's not a, a salient or logical point. You can't, you can't blame, you can't take it out on a five-year-old who is in a, it's still safe, borderline unsafe environment, because of poor management before they were born. Not fair. Two, oh, I had another point. Sorry, I was on a roll. Um, <clears throat> it's not cosmetic. An age of buildings requires maintenance. And at 50 years, for human occupation, and I don't know, my understanding is you have warehouses that are 50 years old, and you are storing probably not people. <laughs> in those spaces. It is, we know now that mold is bad for children. We know air quality is really important. We know daylight, fresh air, make for a better learning environment and a better teaching environment and a better place to exist, period. It, it's not really a question, and I understand that, and, but the cost of refurbishing the buildings to the extent necessary to make them have an air quality and a health quality comparable to what is attainable and what should be done is the same as building new. So I, it, it's, a, it's really important that we keep in mind that this is for people, it's for the town. It's not punitive and it's not fair to punish new residents for mistakes of people in the past. That's, not, that's a great, great piece to know that that's in the mind of, of some of the voters, and that's a great thing that we can argue against, but that's not, that's not okay. That's my piece. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think, Tom, I think Tom's point was around population. And I think it is probably worthwhile, especially when we've seen the graph, it's a pretty striking graph. Um, and we did do a study a few years ago, I think it was 2015. Yeah, there is um, a we, chart in your packet. Yes, yeah, yeah. you, you shared that information. So we did do a study 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, you know, it's one thing to study these things, but when you actually see what the study actually showed, it, it, it ended up being pretty accurate. It does show that the population is going down. It may be worthwhile to spend, I don't know what that study cost us, but it might be worthwhile for the school, the town, to spend the money to see to do that kind of a projection moving from 2020 forward. Because I do think we want to build a school, the buildings that are going to be uh, taking care of the population of the, the, what we actually are uh, uh, having in our schools. And um, if, if all of those things, because it had factors built in there, how many new houses were going to be built, so we, we've had the 2015 to 2020, we actually know the actual results, and they're pretty, pretty close yeah, to what we're projecting. Yeah. yeah, so we, it was pretty accurate, and it does show that it's continuing to go down. So I don't think it was just a point of Tom was trying to make about, uh, you know, who was moving in and, and, and uh, whatnot, but I do think we need to study that a little bit more, because we obviously need to build buildings that are going to be, uh, we're not going to have that, uh, we're not spending money on excess capacity. I would really like to hear from uh, the, when I first went through all the buildings, it seemed like a real focus was what we needed to do at the middle school. And to, to your point, you know, the, the place is jam-packed. The, the point was made through our meetings that the security issue is serious because the building entrance is right there and from 10.30 in the morning until you finish with lunch at 1 or 1.30, most of those kids are right there. Um, that seemed to be the, the focus of what we needed to do most importantly or most quickly. Um, and 
it, it just seems like, uh, uh, well, and, and I, I kind of feel bad that we've got this whole financial conversation going. Maybe I, I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed to spending the money. I want to try to, I want to try to get us started. Let's decide what we can spend, and then get on with it. Because it seems like we're spending a lot of time on two ends of the spectrum, um, and. I, I just remember what the reaction in town was a couple of years ago when the town, when the school board came to the town council and said they wanted to spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars to study what looked like it was going to be a rough, roughly a twenty-five to twenty-seven million dollar project, and the reaction was like, "Oh my God, that's so much money! We knew, never <laughs> had any idea we were going to be looking at that kind of a number." So, it kind of took the town a little bit by surprise, and the reaction was pretty strong. So. What, I, what I'd really like to find out would, would help me sell this project to the town is what are we, what are we going to spend, what can we afford, what you talked about earlier is, so have, have, the, have that number, so if we're going to borrow 50 or 60 or 70, what does that actually correlate to what somebody's taxes are going to go up on there, and, and, and see what kind of reaction we get from the town, what, what they're, what they're uh, willing to support. Um, I think is going to be very important. And part of how we sell that to the town is a real good idea of what the population of the students is going to be. Uh, I think we need to, we, I, th I think we really need to zero in on a couple of those things and, and then come forward with some plans, get some feedback from the town and see what, what, are, what kind of a referendum they would, would support. But, I mean, do you have any feedback? I mean, from a, you're, you're the guy that has to feed all these kids every day. Uh, One, yeah, we are, we are at way over capacity. Um, the, the state mandated that we actually, the way, our, the way the service was set up, we had to actually move and we had to cut in the floor and run cables for our POS systems because they had to be out of, out of the serving area at the point of sale after they had gone through and got all, all of their meal. So we had to actually take and cut in the floor and run cables to run our POS systems, but we lost space in the cafeteria. Where actually, if you were to look at the, what the population should be in there, I believe we're over. It's, it's, it's jam-packed, and like you said, you can't hear anything because the kids are trying to, one's talking over the other, and it's not just that. It's the, it's the, the transitional flooring, it's, it's unsafe, um, and it, it doesn't look good either. Plus. You've got the, the windows that's right there in the front of the building, and you've got 300 kids sitting in there that is in plain view. And I, I think that's one of the things that is the mo most important, like you said, was the safety. So um, also, if you, if you were to go and look, like one of the things I do want to speak on, to Tom's point, I think it is... The people that were here before, I've been here for a while, were not irresponsible with, with the maintenance part of it. It was the, the maintenance, the CIP budget has been cut multiple times. So you figure that's the first thing that, that, we, that we strike out is, is the, the upkeep of the building because we want all the instruction time, which is understandable for a high performing district, but when, when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, we've been deferring off maintenance for a better of 10 years now. So. Um, all these roofs would have been done, and we wouldn't have had any issues if we hadn't got our budget cut. So I don't want to step on Perry's toes, but that was before his time also, too. So um, to think that we're not being responsible as administrators in how we're, how we're um, taking care of the buildings, it's, it's just not true. We're doing the best we can with our hands cut. Um, we only have so much money. And, and we know that. And the buildings, if you were to go through the buildings, and if you, Tom, I don't know if you've been through and done a site visit at the middle school, if you look out the back door of our Pond Cove area, the, the building is heaved. The, the, the floor is cracked. There's nothing that they can do to fix that unless they're going to dig it out. And that's a huge cost. And that's not something the taxpayers would want to do. So over the course of oh, better of 10 years, we've had all our maintenance budget cut. So if we are going to get a new building, then, then maybe we need to have, make sure that we have the money to take care of them. That's right. So that's what I'm saying. And I, I want to stress that point that it's not that anybody that has been irresponsible with taxpayer money. It's that there hasn't been any to do it. And everybody in this room that works here is very, 
I mean, they're very committed or they would not be here because, like Caitlin said, the facility is not the best. It isn't. And I have had many people come to meetings here from other districts that they're very underwhelmed. It, it, it's not what we what we stand for or for a high performing district. And and it's just we need to we need to move forward and we need to figure out what's best for the kids. That's what we're here for. That's what our job is. Um, one of the things that I, I wonder about is um, the last couple of years, I think, when the school board has been seen working with the town council to go line by line through every account and within the school budget, and I'm sure the town council does exactly the same thing. If people see that that process has happened, um, I think the people of Cape Elizabeth have proven themselves time and time again to be super supportive of both the town and schools. The comparable thing to me, I, I, I sort of, I tend to be fiscally frugal to begin with, so I tend to, personally, I also happen to be a taxpayer, think option four should at least be explored. But I don't think it's adequate the way it's laid out. Um, because it doesn't, for example, address Caitlin's band room, which is thoroughly inadequate. It also doesn't address, as I understand it, it doesn't address the problems with heat and cold and the inconsistencies from room to room, which are bad in this building and my understanding are worse in the other two buildings. Um, I, I read through every single page of the 350 page report that the architects did and sent voluminous comments to people and um, I just wonder if a way to build consensus even though it might take a little bit of time I have a feeling that a 26 to 29 million is not really a, 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 a realistic number to address the things that if the smart people in this room got together and looked at the architect's report and said, what do we really want to do? Because it's a really super good report. It's incredibly thorough. And my wondering would be if a, if a group of people or even a couple group of people sort of independently took the time to do that and said, what do we want to do? And I'm pretty convinced it's beyond what is assumed in this 26 million to 29 million number. My guess is that the realistic number would be closer to the 35 million that Matt talked about, and it might even be a little bit more. I don't, I don't know. But it, be, it would begin to get closer, my guess is, to the 53 to 58 million at least, and perhaps to the point where, as a group of people, Looking at the real specifics, the way the school board and the town council do every single year, line by line by line by line by line, I think if a diverse group of people like this came out and said, this 26 to 29 doesn't address the basic needs we have in the, the schools, and that perhaps we ought to take the time to do that. Um, I don't think it needs to be with a large group. I think that would be really inefficient to do it that way, and I don't know what I'm proposing. But I think to go, why I'm happy to be a part of it, um, to go, to go I, there are hundreds of items there. And this 26 to 29, I don't fully understand all the numbers, but I don't even think it includes all of the things that are on this separate listing of red items. And the, right, the red items do not even include things like the band room, and the red items don't even include the heating and ventilation system. The red items, and because that there you're getting the yellows, um, and maybe even some of the greens. I'm not, I can't remember how they classified things. I just think it would be a really worthwhile exercise to go through that, to see what we truly think is the most important, see if 26 to 29 or 37 could pay for it, and if it couldn't, then move to one of the other options. But I know that would slow the process down. But I just wonder if it's more along the lines of what the school board and town council have been doing really effectively the last two years that seems to really effectively build consensus and would get people to buy into it. It, it would make it so much easier to sell it to the taxpayers. The elderly people, the younger people, Republicans, Democrats, everybody. Um, I just, I, I propose that as a possibility. I think it would be a really interesting and probably consensus building exercise. I don't know where it would end up, 
but I think it could lead us to consensus. Could I, could I add something to that? I support that. <clears throat> and I think um, <clears throat> I was asked to be on this committee nine months, a year ago, whatever. And I chose not to do it because there are too many people. And, and you can't, if you need to sift it down to uh, seven, eight, ten, maybe twelve people to get around the table. Um, I would suggest we uh, have um, a construction manager or someone that's really experienced doing projects, uh, educational projects, have them on the team. Maybe someone that might volunteer his time to do in town. I know, I know someone that might, that has a skill set, and just work together and um, and try to bring it in at those levels. But the other side of things, if you phase this, I mean, once the twenty-eight million dollars is paid off in uh, eight years, that that loosens things up, and so um, and it would be. A, a more easy, easier sell. So maybe you do a few projects between now and 2026, and then you do the larger project. But phase it in, that would be my suggestion. If I can make one other comment, just bring on my high school hat for a minute, high school principal hat. If we're talking about a project phase in that takes us so it's eight to eight to ten to twelve years. I mean, here's 2033. One of the things that strikes me is every single one of the options, and this is my high school principal hat, has three million dollars for the high school. Doesn't matter whether it's the first phase, which is first first option, which is done 12 years from now, and we've done three million dollars for the high school over 12 years, or another one which is four years from now, and we've done three million dollars for the high school. It makes a three million dollars for the high school over the course of twelve years is thoroughly inadequate, um, and and the middle school in Pond Cove need a whole lot more renovations than the high than the high school did without any question. I, I think Jeff has a great suggestion. Um, I also think Tom Dunham had a good suggestion about doing this population. Um, projection, and by that I assume he means school population projection, um, because I think once it, we can build on the work that's already been done, it shouldn't cost too much, and they appear to be, certainly they've captured the trends, but once we have a better sense of how many children will be sitting in these buildings, there might be other options. I. I could conceive of an option, right now we're, I think we're looking at over 200,000 square feet for the two buildings, and I wonder if we can't get creative and do one building for K to 8 that's Mercedes-Benz even, because it's one building. Um, but I also like Jeff's suggestion of let's just go through this line by line and see what we need so that we can get started. Um, I'm glad people brought up the population thing because that was one of the things I'd actually been thinking about for the last few weeks and I went ahead and did a bunch of research on my own. I, I'm a construction manager. I'm an estimator by training. So I do this for a living. I do this every day. So I said, all right, let's look at the projections for the population. So I took your charts, looked at the projections through, what was it, 2025? And you're down to 15, 29 as a total. So I said, okay, let's take your Maine DOE guidelines. The uh, state of Maine says elementary school, 140 square feet per pupil. That's what they'll pay in, back when they would pay. Most schools go over that. Basically, it's the school district then decides, okay, we'll go over by 10%. We'll cover that difference, and that's what we'll do. So most schools do that. So they can pick up robotic spaces, maker spaces, uh, any number of amenities they want to add that the state won't pay. So if you say, all right, so elementary schools are 140 square feet per student, middle schools are 160 square feet per student, and high schools are 185 square feet per student. So I just said, okay, let's add 10% add to that, kind of add some amenities. And then I said, okay, let's look at projected population, multiply those out 
for each school. Um, currently, we have about 332,000 square feet, not including the pool. This is just my own estimating takeoff, taking the plans, just mm -hmm. doing rough square footage pair. You can probably correct that if I'm completely off. But um, that roughly breaks down to 84,000 for Pond Cove, 95,000 for the middle school, and 153,000 for the high school. Uh, note that I believe Pond Cove's number includes the cafetorium, and that's kind of a shared amenity, so I just had to decide, well, okay, it's picked on one way or the other. Um, using your projections, at least through 2025, we could go down from potentially 330,000 square feet to 270,000 square feet. That's roughly a 20% reduction in size. So you could just easily, right off the bat, say, okay, our buildings can be right-sized, projecting forward. And if that continues to go down, maybe you make them a little smaller with the ability to add a second phase if you need to expand in a future situation where all of a sudden the population booms again. Um, those can be designed. So I, there is definitely an ability to right size. I think that data is, I mean, I, you know, I spent some time doing it, but it's, that's the data that I have, just using kind of some rough back of the napkin numbers. Um, but then if you project using those numbers, looking at recent school projects that I have information on, um, we're probably looking at $350 a square foot for construction if we project it out a couple of years. I think, uh, I have to excuse me, I have some charts here. So, uh, South Portland Middle School, this actually hasn't bid yet. This would be next January. Um, the state, let's see here, the overall cost for the project, they're looking at about $383 a square foot. That includes soft cost. On a construction cost, they're looking at $308 a square foot. That's what they're projecting. They're hoping that next January when they bid it, that construction cost will come in at $308 a square foot. They, for their middle school, they had 196 square feet per student. I think the state one is about 180. So they're going to pay that difference if the, the state doesn't cover that. So just looking at the historical data of recent schools, like Mount Ararat's at uh, $305 a square foot. That went to bid in May of 18. So if we just projected, okay, $350 a square foot, say two years from now, should be okay, but, and then you look at those square foot numbers and you're probably looking in the range of 30, 30 to 35 million dollars per school. Might just kind of my back of the napkin <coughs> guess. So I think what they projected is fairly accurate and maybe a little bit conservative. So I think there is an ability to maybe pull some of those numbers back a little bit so we don't consider overspending, but at the same time, I, you know, these numbers are not going to go down. So, um, my, my own opinion is I do, I like what people are saying about option four, but I feel it is just kind of a band-aid approach. Uh, looking at the cost, like life cycle costs, looking at operational costs is really important because these buildings are not inexpensive to operate. Um, a new building, very efficient, um, will operate much less expensively. Another problem with these schools is that they're very inefficient the way they're laid out. Um, corridors are not, they're just a lot of spaces that aren't usable that create a bloat of a building. Buildings can be designed much more efficiently and probably meet the needs of the students and the staff much better. Um, my opinion is I'd love to see option one or two. I do agree though, is there a taste, is there a way that we can sell that to the community because that's a lot of money. Um, you know, 70, 70 million is a lot of money for a small town like ours. So I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards option one only because you can kind of take little chunks at a time. The only downside to that is the costs are going to increase on your future phases that just, so that's my two cents. Thank you. I guess when we are sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, when we're thinking about um, any of the options, the high school does have to be part of the conversation. In that, if we're going to have to have the same conversation about the high school down the road in a couple of years, and our 
goal would be to spread, have a good spread between whatever project we decide on here and whatever ends up happening with the high school down the road. So, um, you know, so I, I see that as a slight challenge with option one, that it's elongating the buildings of uh, the middle school and the elementary school, which then if we want to have a nice line spread between finishing that and starting something at the high school, puts the high school way down the road. But anyways, I think the high school just has to be part of our conversation as well. Yeah. Oh, one thing I, I wanted to add, sorry. The phased approach also, I thought about it would be nice in the fact that you're not all of a sudden burdening another generation, say 60 years, 75 years down the road, and all of a sudden they got, oh, three buildings or two buildings that are all of a sudden needing a lot of work. Whereas if you can stagger them, hopefully the, the building curve, as I think the Colby Company had showed, or at least they're staggered enough so that you can say, okay, in the future, all right, we need to do a wholesale renovation of building in Pond Cove or middle school. 10 years, 15 years from now, we can jump to the other school, and then we can do the high school. So having it more staggered versus, I think when all these buildings were built, they were almost built at the same time. So all of a sudden you end up with buildings that are of the same age and need a lot of work at the same time. So I think kind of dovetailing on that, it's nice to have that phased option. Um, I, I love Jeff's suggestion um, I had done not line by line and not careful at all, but sort of looked through those, and that's how I kind of came to the conclusion that, the personal conclusion that probably one or two makes more sense than putting money into all of those renovations. Um, but I think there are a couple more questions that we should look at more specifically. So I agree the population is one of them. We had talked this morning about how a lot of these numbers are backward looking and it may be that we're not going to follow this trend anymore because if you look at what we had talked about was real estate. If you look at real estate, um, when I bought my house here two years ago, it was less expensive than buying a house in Portland or South Portland where I wanted to live. But I think, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, that was not the case. That people were buying in Portland and South Portland because it made it was it was more affordable to buy there. So the other thing that we're seeing are um, people who had children who were part of that spike in the school population now are maybe getting to an age where they're retiring and they may be moving out of their houses and those houses may be now vacant for new families to move in. So it may be that we're not going to continue to see a downward trend. It very well may be the case that we do, but, but there, we should look at those numbers maybe a little more creatively. Um, so that's the other piece of information I would want. And then I think in going through that line by line analysis of the renovations that are needed, it would be helpful to have a more realistic sense of what the high school is going to need. Um, and then we can maybe make some budgeting decisions about, you know, what is, what sort of our threshold for replacing entirely the middle school and elementary school and, and look creatively at what we can do to minimize costs. Like maybe we can do just one building and that way, you know, a few decades down the line, the town's not looking at replacing three buildings, but it's limited to just two school buildings. Um, so I think those are all things that we should look into um, before our next meeting. And I'd be happy to be part of some smaller committee that takes on one of these tasks, if that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, one other comment about bonded debt mm -hmm. is what you are looking at doing is hopefully replacing a 50-year building with a 20 or 30-year amount of debt, if that makes sense. You know, uh, and these, you've got a 1930s building, 1940s wing, so on and so forth. So these aren't exactly short-lived buildings. So that is one of those things you are investing in something as you do have this discussion that you do want to have something that's going to far outlive, hopefully at least one and a half to two times the life expectancy of your debt. So 
that is something that you do want to consider when it does. So as Derek had said, if you stagger it and phase it, you might be able to find that. You can have your debt retiring at certain levels that may be more acceptable, and at the same time, you are buying yourself time. So uh, I, I don't want to put it all doom and gloom when it comes to discussing debt. Uh, but it is one of those things that you know. <laughs> it is one of those things that you, you are investing to your long range future. Yeah. On the other side of it, I mean, there's there's common sense to that. And then the other thing is, when you do look at it from a line by line uh, elements uh, of approach, you may find at some point where, where is your tipping point? Mm -hmm. You know, as far as if you're going to do this, at some point you reach. It's kind of like fixing a car. You've got 150,000 miles on it, it doesn't make sense to put a new transmission in it for five grand, or does it mean that you take that five and put it onto something else? So, you know, those are all on moving parts, but I'm just trying to, you know, I'm, I'm sure that just helped out the conversation and that's Thank it. But, you. <laughs> but, it is, but it is one of those things that you, do, that you do have to consider. And I think if you do talk to people, you know, I will say, uh, People do not talk about bond rating when they do come to the town, but they do talk about taxes. And as your former tax assessor, I can tell you that they talk about it plenty. <laughs> uh, and, and will, and it will always happen. So um, it's just it's just one of those things. But if you do have have a common sense approach and you do come to people, they will look at it and find, you know, that you will find a solution. As Mary Ann said, you know, the, the library went south the first time, and uh, people came back and looked at it. So these types of projects don't happen usually on the first, second, possibly third iteration. So you eventually get there. And I'll compliment the group on doing all the hard work that you have done to get to this point. So uh, it's, a, it's an arduous process. So I think you're right where you should be. What's worth. feasible it is to get one of those population studies put together, how quickly they can do it? I'm not familiar with how quickly they I know how much it costs. So we had one, we just did some questioning. It's about 6000 um, We didn't get a time frame. And that was certainly just one, one estimate. That would be money well so. spent. Yeah, I, I think that would be money well council. spent. It would be an important piece that could help us guide guide us where we're going. <coughs> when was this enrollment vision. study done? Pardon me? When was this enrollment study done? 2015, I believe. Yeah. It was a 10-year projection. I think it goes to 2025. And uh, Donna, your estimate is from the same company, so they would just be updating The estimate enrolling. is from the same company. Good. We certainly could look at other companies. We just wanted an idea of how much yeah. it might cost to do I know. It. I think it makes sense because what we're really doing, I think, is saying build on the work that you've done and add another five to ten years out so that 6,000 sounds very reasonable for them to and It certainly looked like the work they did for us has been proved to be pretty accurate. This is a general comment. I think that's a good idea too, but I just want to also make sure we know what we're using that for. Because I think it's important to know, but it's important to know what we would be building for. Right? Not that information to me at least wouldn't solve the band room problem or the you know, there's existing problems regardless of the trend. And so to me it would be a piece of information to see if we if we did do phase one or two, what that could be. Maybe it's smaller. Right, but it doesn't do anything to me in terms of the existing needs that are in the building report mm -hmm. um, at all, right? Because that is what it is, regardless of the population size. So I just I only say that because I wouldn't want that to be a reason why we stop doing the work we need to do, which I think is very important to keep moving. It would just be for me a really good piece of information if we did decide to work with an architect to say, okay, here's some hard data. Now can you make sure we're building what we need to build? Yeah, I don't see it as an either-or proposition at all. No, good. It's done so that you, you know that you're right-sizing whatever new construction you're doing, uh, and it'll be used to justify the new construction. And if there's a consensus to do what Jeff has suggested, that should continue and start. 
Just one second. Uh, Derek had his hand up. Oh, yeah, I, I was going to uh, echo that. Just right. Really, the whole point of the study is really to decide, oh, do we need a building of this size or this size? Right. Not do we need a building. It's more what size does it need to be. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So what it helps, I think, is what I, what I get when I'm talking to people in, in the community and they're giving me feedback <clears> on this is there's a, this constant pushback <clears> on why do we need more, <clears throat> more school size when they know the school population is going down? What they don't know is that we have more kids in band than we had when Mr. Boffa was in, he had a real popular program. <laughs> but we have more kids taking band now than we did then. And the, the band classroom is jam-packed. We have more mandates from the... This is why. That's yeah. why. We have all these mandates. We've got more <laughs> staff. Uh, we've got robotics. We have a football team now that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. So the population piece is part of it, but we, we've got to also have a good conversation, be able to have a good conversation with the citizens about... These are all the other reasons why we need the size of the, the, the space that we need, and it'll, it'll, that population piece will be just another good piece of evidence to help us with that conversation when we're out there selling the project to the citizens. Yeah. And I'm totally on board with that. So. I just wonder, do you, um, do you have any experience with sort of accuracy of um, having studies done? At, um, Predictions? Yeah. Um, Yes, um, it's just one predict. It's a prediction, is what it is. Um, is it right on? Are they right on? Usually, no. But it seems to make people feel better to do a prediction. <laughs> so, I also it, it, talking about what you brought up and that chart that Harry brought up. You know, the the question is. So we come up to the 2000s, but what is that chart going to look like in 20 years? And so, uh, talking about predictions, how are the spaces going to need to, I mean, 20 years ago, did people anticipate that we'd need closets for OT and speech therapy and that education would head in that direction? That robotics would be so huge and that we would need space for maker space. Like, some of this prediction, it, 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 we, we don't know what's out there and, and, and what those spaces need. Um, and I, I, like you, I like your comment, Derek, about when we do, I mean, these are just very uh, snippets of options, right? Like if we go with an option, obviously it's going to get teased out tremendously, and not for the Mercedes version, but for the Toyota version. Sorry, I pointed to the wrong person. But um, it, my point being is that um, I just lost it. Well, I, I, I don't mean to talk again, but I, I just, the education piece is very important, and I agree completely. And, you know, I'm new to the board. I was actually motivated to run because of the buildings. I was underwhelmed myself um, when my kids started, and i um, been to a lot of schools around the area. Um, more than happy with the schools themselves, but the buildings. And, but what I learned last night at our meeting, I wish everyone in town could have heard, honestly, and I know it was taped. Um, and it's not everyone's going to watch that kind of thing. But we've got to sh have a way to show, I had no idea the amount of space that's required by law and the number of psychologists and social workers and guidance counselors and speech uh, therapists and occupational therapists. I didn't even know we had occupational therapists in the schools, ed techs. I knew that my mom was an ed tech. But the ed techs that are required by law, these are all positions that that uh, most people don't think of when they think of schools. They think of the classrooms and the number of students and how it's gone down. But those are all fixed space costs, if you will, um, that were their mandates by either the state or the federal government. And we've just got to figure out a way to to, let, to sort of educate people on that because that was a real eye opener for me. And that's a lot of I think causing some of the problems. You know that we were creating um, spaces and closets. You know, I learned that last night. Yeah, we're teaching students in class. Right, and so when you just look at the population, again, I think it's a good idea to have because I think if we're going to build, we should build the population. But if you just look at population, everyone, you know, of course you can say we need less space than we needed back in 1950. But we weren't have we didn't have all these other support staff that were again that were required to. It's not an option. So that's an education piece, though. I mean, I think that's you know, you know, it's our job, whatever option we come up with, to to make that case.
Is there a way we can get that handout scanned or something and put on? Is there a way? Can we get a digital version? Oh, no, it's copyrighted. Copy oh, okay. Because, I mean, that would be no. something. We, we keep buying more, so can we link to it? Is there like a. I don't think it's. Draw it out. Perry, can you make <laughs> 7 million copies? <laughs> <laughs> by hand. By hand. <laughs> by hand. <laughs> I, I also wanted to add that I, I just want to make sure that we stay focused on planning for the next 30, 40, 50 years and not focus so much on today. Um, I know there's been talk about, I don't know if it's still a hot topic or not, but there's, there's in, in past years of, that I've been in education, there's always been this uh, lingering rumor of uh, school going throughout the year. You know, right through summer, we are in no way prepared for that um, with air conditioning needs and things like that. So, yeah, I, I just feel that we, we talk today, but we, we're actually got to be predicting a little bit. And, and that goes along with that study as well. I, I agree the study, I think, would be an added benefit, but building-wise, building yeah. and, you know, I'll just throw on that top of that just... Um, education has proven, public education has proven itself to just be increasingly expensive and, and not turning back. Um, so aside of even just the construction part of this or renovation or whatever, if we just pushed all that aside and just looked at the cost of the education in general, we know it's not going to go down. We know it's going to continue to incline. So I... I'm posing the question of should towns, town council or the uh, town's taxpayers be looking at can Cape Elizabeth continue to sustain that increase on their current path? And I'm just going to throw out there the idea of commercial business being allowed into Cape Elizabeth um, to help relieve some of that tax burden. I know there was questions put out to taxpayers before and, and they were not interested in that, but I almost feel like it was it was just kind of a yes or no question. There was never another option that went with it as to, but what if it would help relieve the tax burden of the school and the increases that we see? You know, I think that should have been an extra line added to the question. I Like Matt, I'm not a taxpayer and uh, I can't speak for that, but it's just one of the things that I've seen. I, I, I came from a similar setup in, from Vermont and saw our, our elementary school there was in a, a, an area that was very rural and taxes were a big deal to them. And, and I'll honestly say that their um, annual meetings were very toxic and you know, they're coming with uh, pitchforks and torches. And uh, it, it was all kind of the same thing. They didn't have the, the income that Cape Elizabeth has, but they do carry that same style of tax burden. But they, they closed the door on, we did not want industry in our, in our area uh, or any type of business. And they just eventually paid the price for it and take that on themselves. And just, I know that goes more to town council than, <laughs> than the school, but... I'm just throwing that out there as well, just as an observation. So you're in the process right now of doing your budget for next year, right? So what have you built in for capital improvements? Or do you have a, a certain, do you have a target number you want to have? So this coming year, what are we investing in maintaining the buildings? Uh, is that is that becoming more of a focus to make sure we're spending three, four hundred thousand a year on capital improvements. What? There's there's an increase. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but two years ago there was a big increase and then last year there was another increase and you are decrease, I'm sorry. And now you are trying to bring it correct. back up. Correct. Um, to is it five hundred thousand? Correct. Yes. For this year in the two budget. Years ago. Two years yes. there was a yes. decrease. A decrease. Last year there was <coughs> and then this year there's a, trying to bring it back, proposing in the budget to 500,000. It used to be a million. When I started on the board, it was at a million. Um, 
So and to Mr. Esposito's point, when it gets cut, and it gets cut and it gets cut, you know, we end up with these deferred maintenance problems that become bigger problems that end up costing more to fix them. So, so, so we, I, I, I think the people in town, the taxpayers in town would be totally in favor of making sure that that's not one of the items that gets cut because it's, it's not like you're saving a dollar. You're just deferring a dollar. You're deferring it and then it's costing you, know, you double at the It's costing yeah, you more money. So more. when it comes to when they, when the cut starts to come, you're going to, you got to push back on that. So here, there, there's more context to this situation. I appreciate that support. Um, but at the time that it was first cut, I think it was also a million dollar cut support from the, from the state. So I, I'm going to put you on the spot, but I think Kimberly made a comment to me once. It's like making the choice, do you want to put food on the table or fix the roof in your own personal house? Like, we were in a really, really tough spot financially. And so we ended up cutting the roof so that we could provide for the teachers and the students in the classroom. And we had two years in a row. I don't remember exactly, but first it was about a million, and then it was almost half a million. It was two years ago. Yeah. Um, 2018, it's two years ago. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was massive. And so that's where the CIP budget, and so now we're, we're starting to get a little bit more money back from the state, and that's where this is being attached to. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was a reaction to the fact that we have very little revenue, and the revenue we had was a huge cut. And um, it was the choice we made, consciously. Um, did we want to? No. Um, do we understand that you have to maintain and keep up your buildings? Yes. Um, but it was that, or cutting programs, or cutting teachers, or changing policy to make classroom sizes 30. Uh, there were all sorts of other things that could have happened that we thought were less attractive. So. Um, but when I hear stories that there's mold in some of the classrooms, and your students, your child's the water is running in and dripping up, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and when we have new parents come to town and they're deciding whether or not to bring their kids to this school or not based on some of these things. Um, and I'm not saying, I understand, I've, I've been here, I remember those right. cuts we've had. And we've had years where, I think this year we're going to get more money from, from the state. So uh, I'm glad, to, I'm glad, because capital improvement budgets over the last 15, 20 years been something that's been kind of from year to year you don't know if you're going to have any money uh, and yet we know that respond there's probably is 500,000 a year that's needed uh, and, and, and probably a million a year yeah the, uh, but I also wanted to add that this process kind of stalls things for me as well it's a very difficult time because we don't want to <coughs> throw money at something and end up tearing it out and Peter's walk-in cooler at the middle school is he's been needing one of those for probably as long as I've been here and I don't know how long before that um, and he requests it but I got to kind of push back on it to see where we fall with this project because I don't want to invest you know thirty thousand dollars in a walk-in cooler. Did you get the floor fixed at least to walk into it? No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. I mean, with it's actually the, part of the insurance claim. We, we have filed an so. insurance claim. They get, start, try to recoup the cost, but the floor is heaved. And so, are we going to wait? Are you going to wait to fix it? What if we, if we don't get the insurance claim the way we want it? Are we not going to fix it? No, we have to. We have well, to fix it. We so have to. We whether you wait, we do decision. have a quote for a floor in, we, uh, to, re, to go over the existing floor. Yeah, because I'm a little heavier than I would like to be, but when I walked into that cooler, it was like. <laughs> 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 So I'm going to interrupt right now. It's uh, the meeting. We're a little bit past. Um, it was supposed to end at 8:30, and it's 8:40. And I want to respect people's time. Um, so I just want to thank everybody. Um, Do we want to pull together a group to go through the needs assessment? And, um, I mean, is that kind of is that kind of going back on what was, she was talking about with transparency? Is that in a smaller group? That's kind of that's kind of defeating the purpose of what she was talking about. I don't know. I don't think it, so, it defeats that. Per it's one. Well, group. it's still a small group, it's, and we're not all going to be there, and so they're not going to be all the input from everybody else. So no, that seems I mean like the same that thing. was my concern was that you can't sort of watch 
five groups going on. And I frankly, I want to thank everyone. I think this was a really great discussion tonight. Um, I'd like to see a small group go forward. And I think it's going to be open and it's going to meet. And anyone, I would suggest that anyone wants to show up can show up. No, I, I guarantee that, you, you I won't. Kind of defeating but. the purpose, and then you're going through line by line. And if you have a big group like this doing that, then we're going to end up spending hours and hours. And maybe that's what we need to do. But I, I think, as smaller groups, I think that's kind of going back on on what you talked about with the transparency. Right. Uh, before we do that, I would like to get an understanding of what that group would do, because to me, I mean, this is the committee that was appointed. Right. We, we hired architects, and, and the architects came up with some suggestions, so I, I, I just am a little worried about that idea of lay people, and we are in the community, but going through and deciding, okay, we can pull these and this and that, and we'll, we'll make an option five. I mean, we have, five, we have four options. I think none of them are drilled down to the level that we're going to need, but I would prefer it. You know, a professional help us with that. If we're, if we're going to go, I, I agree with if, that. If we're going to if we're going to build a new building, that I, I don't want. I'd rather have a professional talk to us about what needs to go in there, use the population study, build it to that size. Then uh, I just want to get an understanding of what that group would do before we do that, and, and how it would you know dovetail into the work that we put forward so far. Mm -hmm. I was envisioning this more as an information gathering subcommittee that would then bring that, because one of the things we that keeps coming up in this large group is we need more information on this point and that point and that point. So I think that's what we need is just to task someone to go get the information and bring it back so that we can have a more informed group discussion about what we want to do with that information. I hear that. I also hear Phil's concern of who are we as lay people to make the choice of what's important and what's not? Is that what you're, did I hear you correctly? Right. Like if we are going through as, 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 if there's a subcommittee going through and saying, oh, well, this one's valid and this one's not, and I'm, I'm exaggerating, but um, that you would prefer, we've, we've got a good study, maybe uh, following up on both of your recommendations to get more information and narrow it down, and you is, uh, maybe that's a ask for Colby and company to come up with a, middle another option that isn't that's in between option four and option one and two and not with portables that's like an option three um, something that doesn't cost quite as much and then you have the professionals doing the work um, and, and they've already done the work though. I mean they <coughs> outlined the red items and the yellow items the green items. I thought Jeff had a really good suggestion that now it should be a group, users, b people from every bu building. I would love to invite Tom Dunham and anyone else back here who's got expertise to go through it line by line. I don't want to be on the committee, but <laughs> go through it line by line and see where we are. I mean, I think a lot of that work's been done by just color coding it. And the folks who work in the buildings know what's a priority. Oh. Um, so, just to follow up on, I think what Jeff was suggesting is that in his just ballpark, he thinks that numbers, those numbers are probably possibly inadequate for the high school, and that if we really looked at what we needed to do just to get, do that sort of option for patchwork, it might cost us even more. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I suspect that's what's going to happen, and I suspect it's inadequate for the middle school in Palm Cove mm -hmm. as well, because my understanding is it doesn't include such things that, to me, have to be done, like yeah. you walk into Cleveland's band room, and, it's, right. and, and if you live in the buildings in terms of the heat and cold and all that sort of stuff, that's, to me, if we're going to reno if we're gonna even think about just renovating as opposed to a new building, that's got to be addressed. Um, I mean, one advantage of having somebody, if we were to do something like this, having somebody from Colby there is, Colby gave some, and certainly I would love to have, if there's a group, and have Perry be a part of it as well, certainly bring some expert. But some of the items have pretty specific price ranges. Some of them have enormous price ranges in terms of how you tackle things. So in, in that sense, having somebody from Colby or 
somebody who's got some, some familiarity with estimating would be really, really helpful. If the committee thinks that that's a worthwhile exercise to do. So I, my sense is, as was mentioned, we, we did hire professionals, and these may be, you know, there's probably windows of accuracy and room for error in each of these numbers, but I think we have, we have four options where we can roughly say this is going to cost us the most upfront, this is going to cost us the you know, middle range, this is the, the least expensive option. The only piece that I don't see readily available that might be have been somewhere discussed at a previous meeting is if we spend, let's say option four is a roughly $30 million bond project, where are we in 10 years? And where are we in 30 years? And are we just, are we going to come back and be told, well, you weren't fiscally responsible, and now you have to spend $100 million on the exact same project? So what I, I think, I think this information with sort of where do these, where do each of these options get us in 10 years and 30 years? And then we have the information we, we need to, you know, to make the decisions. We, we want to say, are we going to spend the money now and 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 get it done, or are we going to wait and then make it the next generation's issue to take care of? So, I don't think we can simply say, oh, this one's 30,000, 30 million. This is the best option because we're then deferring the, the issue for you know the, the next generation and putting off the cost, which I think is what has potentially been happening now. And now we're in this position. I don't think we have time to try to. Needle in and and delve into each of these options. I think we need to. I think it's, it's urgent that a decision is made. I really I really do, and I think I don't think it should be done foolishly. But we need to start moving forward, and it can't be. Um, I, I don't. I don't. Sorry. Go ahead. That's what Peter was going to speak. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll go after. So, to Jeff's point about option four with some enhancements and some more digging in. One of the things that, that I do think we, we can't lose sight of is all the red projects, okay? Because, you know, here, to, to your, your point, there's probably some things that are not big expense items, but they're red. I'm just looking at this, fan blades exposed to outdoors. This can't be a huge project. But the ba the basically it says, renovate the fan assembly to provide finger protection, to prevent human entry and make <laughs> weather type that, you know, these and that's just one you know if we go through all the red ones there's a lot of red ones we don't they've already identified them we've already mm -hmm. paid them they show us what they are these things could we still could address a lot of these because we're going to probably have this vent for a while until we do something major with but you know why can't we at least proceed with some of the things that have been identified we've paid professionals they've told us this is unsafe you know, and, and so I would like to, to keep on the possibilities of going after some of these red items uh, because they're, they're in places that we're going to keep these buildings. It's not a matter of getting a bigger band room. They, some of these red items are, are safety kind of things that we, we should and could afford to do right away. So I think um, I, agree, I agree with Phil that we should wait for the study and I think we should right size the buildings, but I think we ought to have a couple of other options out there. I think we ought to meet with, with Colby and, and go over those options. I don't think we should do it in a small group. I think we should do it as the same group that, that you've got here. Um, then we can go through, and I mean, we're not going to nitpick and picking tile floors and all that stuff, but be able to see, see if there are options and tell, give them the, the charge to come up with a couple of viable options that is in this certain range and then I mean you may see that the square footage may go down after the study or you may see that with with Perry's list there and the handout that it may go up we don't know that for sure right now so maybe we ought to have the professionals that we've paid money to do all this work come in and, and, and do that instead of us as you know not not professionals in that area to just you make those decisions. We we know that some of the items do have to be replaced or fixed or whatnot. But the, the, there's so many, there's so many. And I mean, if if you were in the schools every day, you would you would see this. It, there really is. It's um, I feel with with fighting against the tide and, and, and down the road 20 years from now, we are going to be in so much trouble. I think with the way the buildings are right now. 
I mean, I think you think that we've deferred maintenance and whatnot. You see that in 20 or 30 years from now with the existing facilities we have, and it's going to be way more. We're talking 100, 200 million down the road. That's, that's all. Um, I think we all understood Jeff incorrectly, in my opinion, because he was alluding to a point that option four exists, but it does not include a lot of the stuff. If you go through the list, option four is going to grow so much that option one will be much better. This is what he's alluding to. That's what the group is going to do. But our work has been done for us already. So if we are not reading it, if we're not reviewing it, if we're not obliging to buy it, like you said, these are professionals. So maybe next time we come, we we'll read the whole manual, the 350 page again. <laughs> Can we get that on tape? Can we get that on tape? You can do the minutes for that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Nancy. I just have one recommendation. I, I agree with what Tim just said. I thought of that. I think, you know, this isn't just me speaking. We have a process I think we've gone through where we have one more meeting scheduled. Um, you know, I think, I think it's important to, to decide on a, you know, on an option. I just, I, that's what I think. I think we're, it's time to do that. But I also think that there are red, red items that need to be done even before we would do any one of these four. There's two or three years even. And some of them aren't throwing good money after bad, like maybe this fan, right? Like there's going to be stuff that's red that has a two to three year lifespan, or they're just immediate health concerns, health and safety concerns. And so maybe what we do is we do have a smaller group, and maybe it's a staff group or something that goes through that report and pulls out on, a, on the same track that we're doing this thing and saying, okay, here's what we've identified that needs to be done regardless of the options, right? They're red items. They're not expenditures that would be throwing good money after bad. And also, it's a way to use our report. We paid for that. And it's giving us good information. I think we, we, we do need to see if there are things that we need to do today. But that's just my recommendation is that we have two parallel paths on that. So we, we keep with what the charge has been to this committee, and then we also have someone, you know, go through that, that report and figure out what needs to be done today. I believe, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, just say. remember that we have the revolving renovation yeah. funds right. that we are working Pulled on. Pulled out some taking, of those. Yeah. They yeah. Were, those yeah. things were taken right out of the Some of those, like the exhaust in the... All of them were taken right out. Some of them were already taken out. Yeah. 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 And, and so great. they will right. be done. I'm yeah. sure so some of the CIP is raised from that. So yeah. it is being Good. it yeah. is being utilized. Good. I don't know if that exact example of a fan, but um, it is. Well, one of the things I wanted to point out about the book too is it's great for me as far as facility needs. It does not really address academic needs. Um, I think I think at each school they put a a brief paragraph as far as not meeting the needs, but as far as the list, the red, green, and yellow list. There's not really much broken out there as far as the academic needs of special ed and what the principals deal with every day and, and even Peter as well. Um, that was just kind of generalized in one of the paragraphs at the beginning of the book. And, and I, I think that is a huge portion of kind of like what Jeff was saying is we can go through and break out each item one by one, but there's a bigger picture that needs to be added to that. And I think that's that academic picture. And somewhat of some aesthetics too. I'm gonna to throw that in there as well. Um, for drive-by purposes and families looking to move in. Um, you know, it's, we, we're not really doing, or we'll say we haven't done much with our schools and they're starting to look like it and you have high taxes. So new families coming in, what are, what are they getting for their money? I, I think if, if you have both of those, you will have a de decreasing, continual decreasing uh, enrollment. So I, to, to me, the, the fixing up the schools is the town's largest investment and the thing that will draw families to the area. We already know we have the academic, um, you know, the principal and, and their staff are doing an awesome job, but they're also in competition with our surrounding communities. You know, our Scarborough, uh, South Portland, Yarmouth, they're all not too far down the list behind us. 
and they have all got newly renovated schools. So what are we Is the next? plan to make yeah. that? Yeah, for the next meeting. Population study. Mm -hmm. And it's only a couple weeks, so. I know. So we may need to postpone that meeting. If that's, if that's truly the next thing that we need to look at, we may need to postpone the meeting until we can get that done. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't know that the population study is really going to change the the vote, right? I mean, it's the right size of the school, so instead of a seventy million dollar building, it's a sixty five million dollar building, right? Like, if you just take a, a step back and you know, I, I could cheek say all the names here, but the gentleman over here was talking about right sizing. It doesn't affect you know. It's not. It's not a $35 million drop in the price of the school. It's whether you do the entire project or a piecemeal thing that's not addressing the issues. Right, that, that's not, you know, it's a great piece to have for the design tool when you go through to make the actual building and, and a good thing to have for the argument for the bond that will pay for the building that's designed the right size for the people. But it doesn't change the in basic argument of do you do the seventy million dollar option or the thirty million dollar option? That that it's not a, it doesn't really, I, and I think it would be really a nice piece of information to have, and I don't disagree with it, and I think it will only help make the argument in the future for the, the bigger, nut, clearly biased, but, it, it's not, it, it shouldn't slow down the committee or or cause a, a change in the vote process because it doesn't, you know, grand picture doesn't really change the. The, the total cost. It's it's still either, you know, maybe it's a seventy instead of seventy seven. You know, if not, it's not it's not a huge factor in it. No, I think I add something to that <clears throat> from my perspective <clears throat> as a citizen, it, you need it <clears throat> to market whatever cost you come up with. Because I I, I know I'm right <clears throat> on the changes in this community. And if I know it, others either they don't know yet but they'll see it. And so that study, I think, is extremely important for us, I mean, people in this room, to sell uh, whatever we choose to do. I Absolutely. think the gentleman is Correct. saying that. So, I think he's well, saying it, it, it doesn't need to happen. It, it needs to happen for the sell, that maybe not for the decision of new building versus working with what we have, is, is the mm -hmm. argument from the gentleman. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, like I think you had alluded to earlier, whether it's 65, 70, or if it's 30 to 35, I think that detail, I think the, de the decision is which option. We're not deciding on the specific number for that option at that point. It's let's tease this out some more. Let's look at, let's actually do some more in-depth research into this option. And maybe we decide at the end of that, we go, oh, this really isn't going to work. We might have to go to option B. But I think, I think for the purposes, is like he was alluding to, is let's, we have four options. Try to figure out what we think is the best path. We can use this information to fine tune it, right size the building, say, okay, now the number is actually closer to 32 million or 74 million or whatever that specific number is. I think, I think that's. Um, I would like to wrap this up. I feel like we could keep going for another hour easily. Um, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of opinions, and they're all. It all be really valuable, and I appreciate everybody for speaking up, contributing, um, and we're still in the conversation. And I actually, I, I really look forward to the meeting, which is the 17th. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? 17th. Here. We'll continue the discussion. It's on a Tuesday, right? 17th, I believe, yeah. is on Tuesday night. <laughs> so just to let people know that. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think we're at a point to make a smaller group. Do you agree? To make a smaller group it to like analyze we it, to we just need to continue. So I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And thank you all thank again you. for being here and for your dedication.